दिल्ली में स्टेट बैंक ऑफ इंडिया जो आपकी हेड ऑफिस के पास उसमें गया उनसे जाकर बात उन्होंने कहा हाँ ठीक है अगर आपके पास नौकरी का ऑफर है और उसमें आपका सैलरी लिखा हुआ है तो हम आपको लोन दे देंगे तो मैंने स्टेट बैंक बैंक ऑफ इंडिया से लोन लिया करीब दस हजार रुपए का और दो टिकट खरीदे उस जमाने में जर्मनी जाने का तीन हजार रुपए का टिकट आया था बाकी कुछ फॉरेन एक्सचेंज ही कुछ गर्म कपड़े खरीद लिए जर्मनी चले गए जर्मनी में जाकर के बड़ी मेहनत से काम किया और वहां जाकर के बहुत अच्छा वर्क कल्चर सीखा कि चाहे बर्फ पड़ रही हो चाहे पानी बरस रहा हो सब लोग सुबह आठ बजे काम करने पहुंच जाते हैं तो मैं भी सुबह छह साढ़े छह बजे उठ जाता था जल्दी जल्दी तैयार होकर के और पहुंच जाता था काम करने के लिए तो जो हार्ड वर्क जिंदगी में मैंने सीखा बचपन में तो ठीक है सीखा फैक्ट्री में काम किया कंपनी में काम किया वो सब किया लेकिन जब मैंने जर्नल्स को देखा तो उनसे बहुत प्रेरणा नहीं और आज तक भी मेरे अंदर वो है कि मेहनत से काम करना है अचीवेबल टारगेट्स सोचने हैं और उनको अचीव करना है क्या आप बचपन के दिनों में एक घर में रहते थे जहाँ आठ लोग रहते थे आप पढ़ाई करते थे हमें सी बी सी कर रहे थे तो कैसे समय निकाल पाते थे जगह कैसे बना पाते थे आप अपने लिए पढ़ने के लिए पढ़ने के लिए रात में तो कोई संभावना थी नहीं क्योंकि जैसा मैंने आपको बताया घर में चार चार पाइयाँ मिल जाती थी और एक ही चार पाई में दो दो लोग सोते थे दो जगह भी खुले थे तो पढ़ने का समय यही था कि स्कूल से आने के बाद थोड़ी बहुत बातचीत करके अपनी माँ से मिलकर कुछ खा पी कर छः बजे से नौ बजे तक मैं पढ़ता था और मेरा काम मतलब यही था कि रेगुलर पढ़ाई चीज कीजिए तो फिर इंसान में दिक्कत नहीं होती है और नौ बजे खाना मैं खाता था और दस बजे तक सो जाता था आराम से और आदत पड़ रही थी कि अगर आसपास लोग बात भी कर रहे हों फिर भी आई यूज टू फोकस ऑन माई स्टडीज I still remember when I was in eighth grade. Yeah. We had to make a choice whether you want to study science, commerce, or arts. I got ninety-three marks in Sanskrit. So my Sanskrit teacher wanted me to uh, study uh, languages. So he wanted me to go for art side. My commerce teacher wanted me that I should take commerce. But I was myself interested in science. Because well, science always fascinated me. Anything you look at and you compare the past, there is always some new things are coming up. See, during our time, radio was a Thing. But we heard that in America, television is a, a new gadget yeah. where you can watch the picture also. I used to think about one day getting an opportunity to fly. So all those gadgets that I used to see, science fascinated me. And I wanted to study science. Another reason was, I... I was very fascinated by medicine. So I wanted to study something which is close to medicine. The reason was I didn't have money to study medicine. Even if I qualified pre-medical test and joined a medical college, even during those days, some 100, 200 rupees per month expenses were there. And I had no source of money. So I thought, let me, let me do science and try to work on 
perhaps developing new drugs or developing new vaccines or developing some diagnostics so that my mind orientation which is more toward medical sciences can be used. So science fascinated me. Like since class 8 you were inspired and you were having these ideas. Sir, so you have studied into Hindi medium school. Yes. Did PhD in Kanto and then came to Germany. Germany. So, how much a language was tough for you and how you have learned yes. that language? Let me tell you, I, I studied in Hindi medium until 12th grade. Till 12th grade. Okay. And uh, once I reached to, to take admission in college, so it was a shock for me to go and study BSc classes because all the teachers are teaching in English. Yeah. I could understand what they are teaching but it was very difficult for me to write English as well as speak English. So what I used to do, I used to take notes very fast just like a stenographer. So that when I go home, I can write it down properly. And since I am understood in the class, if I read that, I can understand it. But to understand a question in English, then I used to think the answer in Hindi, then I used to translate in English. It used to take time. So my first terminal examination, I did not do very well because I could not finish the paper. So my teacher asked me that why didn't you do well? So I told them I could understand, I could think the answer in Hindi, but by the time I translate and write it, the time used to be up. So instead of answering five questions, I could answer only three or three and a half. So therefore I couldn't score very much. But gradually, I learned how to express myself in English, but still I could not talk in English. So like that I finished my master's and once I was in PhD program, uh, all my professors were non-Hindi speaking people. Somebody was from Maharashtra, somebody was from Tamil Nadu, somebody was from West Bengal, like that. So the conversation used to be very funny. They would talk in English and I would reply in Hindi. But one day I realized that uh, this has to stop. And I still remember that uh, I met my wife in the PhD program and she was from a very good family. She could speak very good English. And I always thought, why can't I speak like her? So she said, no problem, you should. You should listen to All India Radio, the English news. You should uh, read English newspaper. And when you read English newspaper, you should read loudly rather than uh, just reading. And uh, my pronunciations were horrible. So I asked my wife that. Uh, if I pronounce anything wrong, you can correct me and I used to note down the correct pronunciation in my diary and I always kept a uh, Oxford dictionary in my bag and I immediately used to see what is the correct pronunciation and I also joined in the evening a course run by Lingua Phone Institute. They used to teach very good English. And the good thing about the course was you pay one time 120 rupees and you can go there as long as you don't feel confident. As long as? As long as. And I think within two months I gained confidence and I could talk in English, I could write English. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. So, then I finished my PhD as I told you and I, I shifted to Germany. Yeah, yeah. 
So you have done research in Anthrax. Mm -hmm. Would you want to elaborate about what Anthrax stands for and why, what inspired you okay. to have this subject, select this subject sure. and research on this? Sure. Uh, see, I worked in Germany and for some times I worked in France, followed by I moved to United States. Yeah. And in the United States, I worked in a laboratory where they used to work on anthrax, but not on the development of vaccine. They used to work on how the anthrax toxin kills. When I returned to India to take up a job in Jawaharlal Nehru University, one day I saw a news item in Hindustan Times that West Bengal is fighting epidemic against anthrax. And since I had a broad knowledge of about anthrax, I thought if we can develop vaccine against anthrax, it will help. So I went to the Department of Biotechnology to ask them if there is a possibility of funding uh, development of uh, genetically engineered vaccine against anthrax. So they were very positive and they said sure there is a percent possibility and uh, you can submit your proportion. So I submitted the proportion and uh, eventually it was funded. That funding was very good. I mean, today's term I can tell you it was something like $250,000, something like quarter million dollars. So I could set up all my laboratory and I started working on that. So the incident in West Bengal inspired me. It took 20 years to have a genetic vaccine. Yes, it takes long time, okay? So, see, there In these years, like, you must have struggled a lot, must have have pressures and competitions. So, how you used to take a deck on all those things and still focus into the same topic and subject? See, the advantage I had was, I had very bright students. See, you don't work alone in the Yeah, family. you have a team. You have a team. And uh, GNU attracts very bright students. And uh, fortunately, I was very well funded. So I could provide them very nice facilities. And I was very friendly with my students. So we could, I could motivate them to form a nice team and work together. But developing a vaccine is a long term long game, term. As, as you said rightly. To develop any vaccine or any drug, these days takes at least 20 years before it can go to the market. Because the laboratory work can be completed in 5 to 10 years, no problem. But then the vaccine has to be tested in uh, animal models up to monkeys, the vaccine has to be tested for preclinical toxicity. Then the, there are regulatory requirements, you have to go to Drug Controller of India and they have to approve that vaccine for human clinical trials. There are four levels of human clinical trials, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, phase 4. So it's a long, 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 long process and uh, it requires a lot of money. Requires money, even time, and the most important one. How you going to motivate your student? Ki, abhi tak lage rena and maybe doing a lot of things. Yeah, it's, it's something like you know, uh, if you are able to develop a vaccine in your lifetime yeah. and able to transfer it to the industry, industry, the kind of satisfaction you get uh, that motivates you because many things you read in the Textbooks, somebody would have worked day and night, then only they could have achieved. So I was very fortunate that all those students were very keen to learn 
and when we talked about it, uh, they got interested and uh, used to work day and night. For example, when we first tested this vaccine in mouse model and it worked, that was the I think, biggest, I think, biggest uh, happiness and happy, happy day of my life. Happiest day of my life. It was the first time. Yeah. It was the first no, time. Of course. No, there are many, many failures yeah. uh, before you before you make it. Yeah. Uh, we had something like sixteen failures. Sixteen failures. So I used to tell my students that it is something like uh, one Mahmood Gajnavi attacked India for oh, sixteen seventeen times and only in seven yeah. time. So we kept uh, uh, trying, trying, and eventually we succeeded. And once it gave the result that it is protected in mouse form, then we, then we wrote to many industries uh, that if some industry would like to partner with us and take the vaccine up to the human clinical trials. And before that, you have to do the trials of the monkeys and preclinical trials, etc. And uh, I wrote that letter to 10 different companies. And one company was very enthusiastic. Within two hours of receiving the email, they came to my office. And uh, we had a discussion and explain them what this vaccine is and uh, they decided to buy the technology also. and then we trained those uh, scientists from the from the company in, in our lab taught them how to make the vaccine then they went to their company, they tried to make it. There also they had some difficulties and we went to the company and tried to help them and eventually they could make it in the company also. And then finally we helped them to take the animal efficacy trials of the monkeys in collaboration with the laboratory in Bhopal. Uh, where they had the facilities to test it in the monkeys also, rabbits also, guinea pigs also. So when all the clinical trials were done in animal models and it was successful, then of course they got the, they took all the data and uh, showed it to Drug Control, to drug control of India. And Drug Control of India gave them permission to do human clinical trials. And they did phase one clinical trials followed by phase two clinical trials. And now they are the third phase. Third phase will start. Yeah. And uh, eventually fourth phase, fourth phase, and eventually. Next time we have worked with the daily like vaccination for babies. So how do you see that? Yes. yes. Uh, in fact, that was another project which I did. Uh, because uh, rabies vaccine has a problem that uh, it has to be properly stored in cold conditions and in India cold chains are not always working yeah. uh, places may not have electricity 24 hours so quite often you would have seen it in the newspapers that vaccine didn't work because of the uh, proper storage so we thought why not to make a vaccine which does not require uh, storage at a lower temperature because DNA is highly stable molecule and if you make a DNA vaccine it will perhaps can stay at room temperature and uh, transportation problem will not be there, storage problem will not be there. So what we did there, there is a molecule called glycoprotein G, uh, we cloned that molecule uh, in the 
form of uh, DNA and try to test that vaccine in uh, animal model and give it good results. So this is again uh, something which is successful but eventually if it goes to the market it will take plenty of time. But currently we are working on another thing. Uh, a therapeutic antibody against anthrax. Yeah. See, suppose somebody has not taken the vaccine. Yeah. And he gets the infection. Yeah. How are we going to treat him? Yeah. See, human beings do not die because of the anthrax causing bacteria. They die because of the lethal toxin which is produced by this bacteria. Bacteria you can kill by taking antibiotics. Of course, this is a very tough bacteria to kill. So, humans have to take antibiotics up to 60 days. 60 days, 2 months. But doesn't matter. 2 months you can take the antibiotics and get rid of it. But uh, once you get the infection and you see the first symptom, during this time, bacteria has synthesized tons of toxin and thrown it in the blood. So, no matter how much antibiotics you take, the toxin is already in the blood and it is going to kill you. So, of late, what we have done is we have developed an antibody against this toxin. So, what you have to do is a combination therapy. The antibody is going to neutralize the toxin yeah. and the antibiotics is going to kill the bacteria to produce any more toxin. Okay. And this combination therapy we tried in a mouse model, it works. Okay. It is able to even reverse the symptoms of anthrax. That's great. For example, mouse gets the, the foot pad becomes swollen develop sedima yeah. and if you apply this antibiotics as well as antibody it is able to reduce, it. reduce the symptoms rather cure the symptoms now this antibody is able to treat the mouse but remember mouse antibody you cannot use it for humans because if you inject mouse body into humans it makes anti-mouse antibody. Okay. So your antibody is not going to work. So this antibody has to be humanized, which is which which is what we are working in JNU still. And once it will be humanized, again you have to go through all the clinical trials, etc. So it's a long market. Yeah. Yeah. So you have received the Presley Visitor Innovation Award in 2016. You're a fellow INSA, NSA, ISA. So, what makes this journey successful? What are the three keys of your success? I, I tell you, I'm a Caribbean, okay? And uh, hard work. Hard work is the first one. First one. Because if you're not ready to work hard, I don't think you can get all these successes. Forget it. Secondly, I am very enthusiastic and I can enthuse people who are working with you. motivated and you motivated and inspired us. Yes. So if you inspire your team yeah. to work shoulder to shoulder, uh, they work hard. And you are more like a mentor who is guiding them how to do the work yeah. and how to make it successful. Yes. And the third thing which somehow I have developed is perseverance. Unless you succeed, you don't give it up. Because in research, 90% of the time you fail. Obviously, yeah. So if you are a person who gets disheartened and stop working, you are not going to succeed. So, I always tell my students, 
that failure is the first step for success. First step for success. success. Because once you fail, at least you know that this strategy is not going to work. Yeah. There are 10 strategies, yeah. but this one is not going not to work. Now let's try the other one. If other one doesn't work, okay, let's try the other one. So, if you get disheartened by first strategy or second strategy which doesn't work and you stop working, you are not going to work in there. Yeah. So, perseverance is very important in this. You don't give it up unless you succeed. Like in 2009, mm -hmm. from professor to you join as a director, director of instrumental research facility in Jane. Yeah. So how much it was difficult as a professor to come to an administrative role? Oh. It was tough or easy? No, no I tell you. I had several administrative roles from yeah. day one. Okay. When I joined JNU, I was made warden of the hostel. Okay. And I tell you, in my hostel I never had a problem. Never. Never. The only thing I followed that have the same rule for everyone. Never give any concession to anyone, never be vindictive to anyone. You should not differentiate people on the basis of who speaks my language, who is from my region, who is from my department, who is so friendly with me. No, yeah. nothing. There was a hostel manual, I read it properly and I used to apply it in letter and spirit. And that helped me. Students knew that if you once say no, that means it's no. no. If something can be done, he gladly does it without thinking twice. So that made my job easier. Then I had another role. I became chairman of Bioinformatics Center very early on. I think six months after joining GNU. Okay. So that gave me some administrative experience and after I finished that, I became chairman of Center for Biotechnology. So I ran the whole center and uh, I kept doing all these. So you were having the difficulties yeah. which you have, as, would have faced. I, I know how to, how to motivate people, how to get the work done. And how to bring results. How to bring results. So when Jane decided to start a advanced instrumentation research facility, I was the former director and uh, there were equipment but 36 crores we were supposed to buy and uh, I always kept them in working conditions. I motivated my technicians to always be very helpful to the uh, people who come to do their experiments. And the facility was open for all, uh, whether you are from JNU or from outside. So it's open for anyone? Yes, it's open. It's still open for all. It's still open. Yes. And then I was not. Yeah. The only thing is we, we put little user charges. If you are coming to use, you know, there we put all the equipment which are more than a crore. Yeah. So everybody is supposed to chip in some money to use it. And that will give me enough money. To, 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 to sustain this facility forever. Yeah. So we, we did that and very successfully and still I, I was there for three years and after that some other director came and all that. So I like uh, that was academic administration. Yeah. As well as your research too. As well as my research. You yeah. joined Kumo University in 2012 yes. and you left after six months. Yes. What forced you to take this decision? <laughs> <laughs> See, when I joined the university, I realized that there were lots of problems. So I figured out what can be done in this university. Okay. And I achieved all those targets in six months' time. Okay, that's great. And once all which was possible to do, I finished. I submitted my resignation. Okay. Submitted your resignation after completing the targets. And after completing. There were no reasons of like, no. There were reasons. Okay. 
See, first thing I saw that uh, the faculty over there was there was kind of inbreeding. And for any university, any educational institution, I think you should you should have people from different institutions, different amazing uh, places, so that everybody comes with new ideas. If you keep uh, self-pollinating, the plants are not having good variety. You always cross-pollinate, you get a good variety. So the mind should also be allowed to interact with different kind of people. And over there, everybody was their student. And uh, I didn't like it. What used to happen that professors will try to hire their own students. First they will give contractual appointment, then they will give a dog appointment, then they will make a permanent. So I called my registrar and asked him how many positions are vacant. It's about 20% positions are vacant. So I said advertise all 25%. 25% positions were vacant. I said advertise all 25%. They are going to hire people. I was told by my registrar, why are you in so much hurry? First year you should relax, you know, it's a nice place to any time. Beautiful hills, beautiful forests. You should enjoy it. Second year you can advertise. And third year you can, third year you can uh, conduct the interviews. Otherwise, you will create a lot of enemies. You registrar was saying this thing. Yes. So I told the registrar. How many students are there on campus? He said, 11,500. I said, I'll make 11,500 friends. If I give them good teachers, teachers. good mentors, they will be happy. So, registrar used to come from Dehradun. So, he used to go during the weekends to Dehradun, his family was there. So I gave him 15 days to advertise. Otherwise, you are not getting outstation leave. Yeah. So he advertised in 17 days. And I immediately ordered the screening committee meeting the very next day and had the best faculty I get anywhere. I got people from Cornell University, I got people from Roswell Cancer Institute, I got people from Max Planck Institute, I got people from National Institute of Material Engineering Singapore, I got people from Canada, Japan, everywhere. And to my surprise, everybody joined. They all joined. They all joined. What I did when I was doing this uh, selections. Some of the contractual faculties they never got the interview letter because they were not up to the mark. Yeah. They went to the court. Okay. And fortunately, the Chief Justice took this case himself. And he not only dismissed the case, he dismissed the case with a cost to these four young people. Biggest message they gave. Biggest message they gave. He gave. And he said that your vice chancellor did the right thing. If you didn't get the interview, that means there was something wrong with you. Yeah. Not with the system. Yeah. He has called 10 people for each faculty position. So you are not any talk. Yeah, you have given equal opportunity, you must find the interview. So I started interviews. I got a lot of pressure from different quarters to select some particular candidates. I didn't listen to anyone. And I selected the best people available. I told all my experts, irrespective of any other factor, please give me the best people. And uh, we 
we selected very fine property. So the profile of the university got changed by bringing these people, big tickets. And uh, then another thing what I did, those people who were selected, I called them personally. Okay. Whether they were in US or they were in Canada or Singapore or Germany or anywhere in the world. I asked them that you should come and join the moment we declare the entry. Because sometimes people like to go to the high court, which is just across the street. And most of the people over there, they have one relative or the other is practicing in high court. So, all of them came to join and the profile has changed. This was the biggest achievement I wanted to make. make. Once I finished that, so I hired all the faculty members in flat 80 days. Meaning the date of joining? No, no. The moment I joined. Within 80 days, I finished that job. And then I thought that uh, now I'm in the university in good hands and let me say goodbye. So once I resigned, the governor was not accepting the, the letter. The letter. And he called me and asked me, that, why do I resign? I said there is no functional autonomy in this state university. Even the state government has not given the salary money of their employees. So we did not have. Our budget of salary was 36 crores and the total budget of the university was 41 crores. We were waiting for that until February and March, you know, the financial year ends. We didn't get the money. So what I did, I conducted the examination in a very economical manner and saved 11 crores to pay the salary. Over there, they always wanted that vice chancellor should come and come with a folded hands and try to please the bureaucrats and then release the money. I said, no, this is your commitment. You are supposed to take care. This is state university. Otherwise also there was a lot of uh, lack of functional autonomy. So I decided to resign. The governor did not accept my resignation for a while and called me and asked why you were resigned and I told him that because of lack of functional autonomy. So he said, I am also going to fight with you for the functional autonomy. I said you take my resignation letter and use it as a weapon to fight, perhaps you will succeed. Yeah. And this happened that next year budget, all 41 crores came in came, came in one check uh, without delay. So I got a call from a from uh, my university professor. He said up Shahadat Kamai. And this year we got the whole minute in one go. And all the people I hired they are doing very well. So like uh, after we left the university he came again to change. Came to Vice Chancellor of right? Yeah. And the very first day you joined, I was listening to your press conference. Mm -hmm. Madan Mohan Malaviji has built this university with the reason that people will come, students will come. First motive would be the character of the name. Yes. And very first day you also said that my focus here will be the character of the name. I, you, if you, you analyze that their, their, their hearing students don't have an equality to gender. Yes. So it, we have. Crossed 100 years, this is 101 year we are still looking into VHO. Where have we went wrong that Madan Mohan Malviyaji Vizan has dictated? And you need to take again his uh, inspirations from him and you need to taste this and actually organize workshops and seminars yes. to build a character of students. Yes, certainly. This is the way to teach students, and I think we had some workshops and some seminars, seminars. where 
we talked about general uh, general clarity we even recently had a workshop to train girl students uh, self defense science actor yeah uh, see if you go back to the history the man became little more powerful because man used to hunt women used to take care of the children yeah so anybody who becomes physically more strong tends to overpower the person who is less physically strong that is what has won in the psyche of some of the students I believe your parents should teach that at home. I was brought up with five sisters, yeah, so I learned to respect them. But some people do not teach their sons to respect the women folks. I did. Men and women should have the equal status. they should have equal rights but even in our society we have seen that uh, women always get the raw deal even sometimes you know women are paid less wages so it is our mindset which we have to change for example i come from jain yeah Uh, there you know we have a gender equality even a girl can walk on the street at 2 o'clock in the night and there is zero chance that any student can do any mischief with her many times my students they finish their experiments at 2 o'clock in the night 2 o'clock in the night they walk to their hostel safe safely no problem but unfortunately in this part of the country they have not been taught to behave the uh, behave the girls respectfully they think that if they are physically more strong they can do anything they can do which is a wrong notion yeah. and therefore we organize more self defense more child the Uh, decide uh, uh, we organize workshops lectures and try to teach boys i have two daughters so i have no uh, no way to discriminate them yeah. but i brought them up in such a way that they do not consider themselves any way inferior to boys yeah. they are both independent they are both financially sound they are both uh, you know standing on their own feet so uh, they are they are they you believe that the girl and boy have to take it in proper shape and even do anything and and so like tomorrow the whole day is running up the whole country is still with teachers right yeah and it's a birthday of surprise and priya that is and less is talked to the mother more maldi is next time so what uh, what you would like to take students and teachers to take tomorrow mm-hmm. to build a bhu on the basis of manan mohan malviya ji say to you any institution if you have the best teachers the institution is bound to do well some teachers are born teachers they teach well but i believe that uh, teaching is also an art which can be learned and particularly being in banaras which is famous for guru shishya parampara yeah. so if we if we take that spirit and try to behave you know as if the students are also our children and guide them properly teach them properly i am sure the biggest happiness you get once you see your students are doing better than you 
they are successful. And this university will produce five Bharat Ratnas, has produced many publishes, many contributions, fellow of academies, yeah. many successful people in different fields of life in India as well as all over the world. I am very confident that teachers who are here can do wonders. And they have done it in the past. Why not in the future? Yes, the, old, the word old, they should take it. Teacher and student. I think teachers should take the oath that these children are our own children yes. and we have to shape their future so that they are more like raw material. Raw material. Uh, see, you can take the mud and create any kind of form. Yeah. And you make it as beautiful as, as you beautiful as you want. And that is the role of the teacher. I am sure that people should come in this profession only if you enjoy the moment when your students are successful in life. This morning we had a lecture in the economics department where one of our students has become uh, vice president of Rajasthan. Right. Vice Chairman, Vice Chairman, Vice Chairman, Vice Chairman. This Harvansh uh, Singh. I could see the kind of happiness uh, in the teacher's face. Yeah. They called all his teachers who taught him. And the moment he came, the first thing he did, he said hello to me and immediately went to his teachers and spent good time with them. Today he came today, yes. And I could see that how happy was he. He was giving all the credit to his teachers. That whatever he is today, it's all because of her. Teachers. Teachers. So if teachers perform their duty, if they discharge their duty, the way I have explained, this country has a great future. Do you see uh, the difference between a teacher and a guru? I would say in India, uh, guru, particularly in former times, they worked very, very selflessly. Yeah. They never bothered about uh, what Shishi is going to give them yeah. and Guru Dakshina or whatever. Yeah. Today, because of the materialistic world, teachers as well as students, students are always looking for that if I study, what will I get? Teachers are also thinking that if I work in BHU, what will be my salary? When will I get promotion? So all those things have come today. Materialistic. Materialistic, okay? But I still have my teacher uh, who taught me chemistry, Dr. Kripashan Vajpayee. He taught us selflessly. Any student would go to his house or in his free time, if he is in his staff room, and he would teach anything you ask him without any expectations. He is around 77. Now, now, still looking for people. And still, when I go to Kanpur, he lives in a small street. I make it a point to go to his home, touch his, his feet, and I always believe that whatever I am today, it's all the problem. And other teachers who taught me that, other professors who taught me how to do research. The teacher's role is very important. Very important. So once like you have been a part of Kumar University, Delhi University, Jain, Divine, BHU, and you have worked in other universities around the world as well. So once you compare the Indian Central University or State University to the Western of, uh, other universities in the world, what difference do you find? Oh, there is a lot of difference, okay. 
uh, first thing is universities in other countries are quite autonomous. autonomous. Here they may call it autonomous, but they are not. Over there, even the departments are very autonomous. Departments. Yes. For example, you go to any US university, appointments are made in the departments, not in the vice chancellor's office. They don't call it vice chancellor, they call it president of the university. They are not made in president's office. Anytime they advertise a position, they invite the person to the department, ask him or her to spend two days in the department, interact with each faculty, give a seminar, interact with students. So two days they watch you, whether you are yeah. going to be one of them or not. And then they sit together and take a decision whether this person is uh, suitable. suitable or not. And their criterion is only academic methods, which is not there in India, mm. not even in central India. You said, like, once I asked to went to Vendu Jam, Jamin, to a private university, you said, then you learned a lot. Yes. So, what teaching you would like to take it, like, the teaching you have taken from there, mm -hmm. what would you like to take it to teachers here? What would you like to say to the teachers here? How they should formulate themselves to bring their upbringing in the way that they should give results. I was I was very impressed with my professor uh, in Germany, particularly in terms of guiding me research. First thing, he allowed us to think freely. But sometimes in India, in the PhD programs, many students, you know, they have to uh, follow what the supervisor is telling. But he allowed me to think freely. He made sure that I have everything what is needed for research. So he was very well funded and I learned from him. That if you want to run a good research laboratory, particularly in sciences, you have to be very well funded and you have to be working all the time for bringing the best facilities which are there in any part of the world. And therefore, I developed a very good laboratory in Jane, which is no less than any US universities. And uh, when my students go abroad, the first email I get, sir, Thank you. I see no difference. Our lab is as good as this one. <laughs> yes, sir. So, and that, that helped me to compete, uh, you asked me, yeah. how did you compete? That helped me to compete with the rest of the world. In my research area, that is on anthrax, there was a survey where our laboratory was ranked number seven in the whole world. Oh, you were in the top 10, you were there. Yes, we were in the top 10. And first two were there from Partial Institute, next two were there from Harvard Medical School, next two were there from NIH in Luxembourg, where I had my training, and fifth and sixth were my mentors. Okay, so I you up. Seven. So, all the culture which I learned in the United States, Germany, and France, I practiced there in India. India. Quite often I see. When the same people go to the United States or Europe, they work very hard, they are very successful. But once they come back, again gradually they come to the system. Come to the system. But I was very fortunate to get a job in the Royal Army University. There it was possible to do everything you want sitting in India. So I never regretted that I came back to India. So under your wise, the head of the university, we can be like sure that this university will grow now. Exactly. In fact, that's what I'm doing. I want to do everything which helps the institution to do better teaching, better research. And whatever it is needed for that, I will always 
hidden within us. What are three major areas as a vice chancellor you would like to work as an ADC worker? Okay. Three major areas. I would like the the most important thing is to bring the best faculty. Okay. Because if you bring the best faculty, job is half done. The best faculty attracts best students. And if you have best students and best faculty, you are going to do awesome. Awesome. Okay. So this is going to be my priority one. First. Second priority will be to improve the infrastructure. Because you cannot attract excellent faculty members. If you don't have, let us say, proper housing for them, or they have to wait 10 years to get a house on them. Yes, this happens in years. Yes. So I have already started doing that. We have already asked the CPWT to start making 300 flats for new teachers. 300 flats. 300. Okay. And uh, the Third priority for me would be to reduce the amount of bureaucracy we have. You will make more independent. I would like them to the bureaucrats to behave in a way that it should be pleasure to do a research project rather than all the time thinking that there are so many bureaucratic hurdles to run a project. I would like to have very good friendly relations with students and teachers as well as teachers. But let me tell you, I would not like to compromise on discipline. This place is to study. Yeah. This place is not for creating jobs. Creating violence. This place is not for physical fights. This place has been created by Mahamanaji. We should respect, respect his, that his wisdom, his ideas. And if you follow that, I'm sure this university is going to do excellent for your in time to work, time to come. Central government have been planning to do some certain changes. Mm -hmm. One of the changes is UGC they want to remove and they want to convert into higher education commission of India. Okay. How do you see this step? See, what is there in the name? Yeah, nothing. Okay. Whether you call it UGC or you call it uh, Higher Education, Education Commission of India. India. I would like that any organization you want to run, it should be run by academicians. If you if you try to impose more Thank bureaucracy. You. If you try to impose more uh, political influence, it's going to fail. So there are academicians. Academicians know how the academic institutions are to be run. There are certain problems in India with the Higher Education Commission of India. Then there will be more revision will come, more bureaucracy will come. So, in fact, that is what. See, ideally. The role of the government should be to give the funding and then measure their success by their rank. Yeah. If you rank higher, you should be supported more. Yeah. And let the university make their themselves behave themselves in a more autonomous manner and in a responsible manner so that they succeed and eventually get better funding because of the higher end. So if you give them freedom, if you 
make the world around us. The chances are that universities are going to perform better. This is not a factory where you have to produce certain things, otherwise you are not going to get your bonus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is intellectual activity. Which we take time. Which intellectuals know the best? No person other than intellectuals should tell us how to behave. Yeah. But the responsibility is on us. Yeah. If intellectuals don't behave the way intellectuals are supposed to, the more regulation, the more bureaucracy, the more political influence will come. I can guarantee. So it's upon us to I behave think. in such a manner. Yeah. That nobody thinks about controlling you. Uh, very good to hear. Yes. Like central government also came with an idea that seven five institutional central university, including GNU and BHU, they'll generate thirty percent of funding by sales. So no, that idea was dropped down. I mean, it was like if I'm going to ask my question from you, and if that fifteen percent, seventy percent, thirty percent still came by the way, idea dropped down. Right the thirty percent amount, how much it would be? And will it be possible for BHU to generate by itself? Like it's some I, I, I mean, let's not let's keep BHU away at yeah. the moment. Yeah. If you really want to know my personal thoughts, okay, yeah. which is contrary to the way country thinks. Yeah. In my opinion, maximum funding should go for primary and secondary education. Okay. Okay. For higher education, there should be three categories. One category where the students are highly meritorious, they should get free education. Not only that, they should get scholarships. The other kind, the second category where the students are not so meritorious, middle ranking. But they have means to pay. They should learn to pay for the higher education. The third category, again, you know, the middle ranking, who cannot afford to pay, they should get soft loans and they should be allowed to pay for a period of 20 years, slowly, so that it doesn't pinch them. This should be the model for higher education in my opinion. And those people who are not very good in studies, they should not be coming for higher studies. Rather, they should be going for some vocational studies. They have learned up to 12 good English, good mathematics, good uh, general knowledge. And they can learn anything. Whether they want to become an electrician, they want to become a plumber, they want to become a carpenter, they want to become a uh, computer operator, whatever. They should learn something. They can become a paramedics, they can become anything. Yeah. So they should learn a vocation so that they get gainful employment. Here, what is happening in India that anybody who finishes 12th grade thinks that. He or she should go to the college. I see. Irrespective of whether you are talented. really talented to go for higher studies or not. But this is a radical view. This is your personal view. Yeah, this is my personal view. So my last question to you. Like what if I ask like what three keys students should follow if they would like to become a come to academics or they want to be successful in their life? So three things are what will happen if any student wants to do a career in the future? Yes, sir. What are the things? First thing, students are to be disciplined. Discipline. Most important. Yeah. Second thing is they should be hard working. Hard working. And third thing is that they should develop some mental strength. Mental strength. So that if there is a failure, they should have energy to. Do it again, rather than giving it up. 
and tell it again what I told you, perseverance. I mean, do things until you succeed. Thank you, sir, for your time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir.